Psalm 78, page 514. As one person's already commented already, it is a very long psalm. And you might be noticing that as soon as you've opened it up. I'm not going to read all of it. Uh, I'll read the first little bit and then I will reference it as we go along. Psalm 78, page 514. A mascal of Asaph. My people, hear my instruction. Listen to my words. Uh, Listen to the words from my mouth. I will declare wise sayings. I will speak mysteries from the past, things we have heard and known and that our fathers have passed down to us. We will not hide them from their children, but we will tell a future generation the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, his might and the wondrous works he has performed. He established a covenant, a testimony in Jacob, and he set up a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children, so that a future generation, children yet to be born, might know. They were to rise and tell their children, so that they might put their confidence in God, and not forget God's works, but keep his commands. Then they would not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not loyal and whose spirit was not faithful to God. The Ephraimite archers turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant and refused to live by his law. They forgot what he had done, the the wondrous works he had shown them. This is the word of the Lord. Well, each week on Monday afternoon, I drive out to Balada to do scripture uh, with the school out there. It's a great opportunity. I get to share Jesus with the whole school. Uh, I have friends who ask, wow, how many kids do you teach at, at scripture? And I then tell them it's a very small school and there's only about 16 kids. But it's wonderful to be able to share my faith with them and to share the good news of Jesus with them. Uh, to pass that on to them. One of the other great things about Balada is that it's a 40-minute drive out and it's a 40-minute drive back. Uh, It's enough time for a sermon or for a good conversation with a friend. Uh, For the most part, the drive is easy. But I think it's in the easy that sometimes issues can arise. I wonder if you've had this experience Now, you're driving down a very easy country road, and unless you're concentrating and actively maintaining a straight line, the car just ever so slightly drifts to the left. Now, it's a slow drift away from where you're meant to be towards where you're not meant to be. Now, apparently, it's a design of Asian cars. Uh, They design it so that you don't drift into oncoming traffic and that you slowly drift into a safe curb. Uh, they, I think, have forgotten that there are no curbs on the way to the ladder. Cars are meant to be on the road. It's the best place for them. It's where they're designed to be. But where you're not meant to be is slowly drifting off, driving off-road through the grass and into a ditch. Now, if not corrected, cars would slim- simply drive their own path. They would go their own way, and naturally this can have devastating effects. Our cars need constant correction. And it's not too dissimilar, I think, for followers of Jesus. Unless we are proactively bringing our faith back to centre, a slow drift can occur. And by nature, unfortunately by our sinful nature, that's our default. A forgetfulness. It's the slight drift. And as we'll see, forgetfulness leads to all sorts of issues for the community of God. It was the case for God's people 3,000 years ago, and it's the same for God's people today. Let me pray as we get into the text. Heavenly Father, give us faith to receive your word, understanding to know what it means and the will to put it into practice. And we ask you powerfully speak to convict, comfort, and conform our minds to yours. Uh, 
Amen. Psalm 78 is unique among the songbook of God's people. Some psalms are clearly praise psalms, some are laments, others call God to act justly and to avenge his people. Still others are a longing for the return of the king. Other than Psalms 1 and 2, the psalms channel the emotions of the people towards God, asking, pleading, praising. They are directed towards God, seeking that he act in some way for them. Psalm 78 is unique. I wonder if you picked it up. It's not directed towards God. It's directed towards God's people, and it's for their benefit. Now, verse 1, a mascal of Asaph. My people, hear my instruction. Listen to the words from my mouth. I will declare wise sayings. I will speak mysteries from the past. Now, Psalm 78 is a wisdom psalm wrapped around Israel's history. Now, the author is not merely wanting to convey history, but wants to remind his hearers of God's provision. He also seeks to remind God's people of their failure to remember the covenant between themselves and God. God's people were meant to represent him to the world around him, or to around them. And yet, time after time, they forget who God is, and they forget all that he has done for them. And so the writer speaks wisdom to the present generation, reminding them of what's been passed down to them. And he reminds them to be passing the things that we have heard and known on to the next generation. The psalmist recalls times in Israel's history when they strayed and rebelled against God. And he also recalls what God's response was. Learn from past generations teach future generations. And so we get the main point in verses 6 and 7. Verses 6, so that a future generation, children yet to be born, might know. They were to rise and tell their children, so that they might put their confidence in God and not forget God's works, but keep his commands. So here is the positive reason for the psalmist's writing. He wants to spur on the present generation to tell the next of the praiseworthy acts of Yahweh, the Lord, his might and wondrous works he performed. Because failure to do so, they might be like their fathers, previous generations that were stubborn and rebellious, a generation whose heart was not loyal and whose spirit was not faithful, as we read in verse 8. The writer is pointing people to God's provision in order that there would be faithfulness, while also holding out a strong warning as to what happens when people forget God and his praiseworthy acts. Now, to set the tone, the writer provides an example of unfaithfulness. He looks at the Ephraimite archers in verses 9 to 12. Uh, They turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant and refused to live by his law. They forgot what he had done, the wondrous works he had shown them. And so begins a cycle of remembrance and teaching, the, the forgetfulness of God's people, which leads to discontentment, lost identity, and the realisation that they need salvation. Uh, Those three main points are up on the screen. Uh, You do have an outline in your bulletin, but that's a bit more full for you. Uh, So point one, discontentment. Uh, From the outset, the psalmist wants to remind God's people of what God has done for them. In contrast to the unfaithfulness of Israel, verses 12 to 16 is a brief recap of the Exodus and the wilderness period, and it highlights God's faithfulness. There will be another recounting of the Exodus later to reinforce the mighty acts that God took to redeem his people. Egypt plays a pivotal role in God's redemptive story. 
It's where he took a people for his own and made them a kingdom of priests. Picking up in at verse 12, he worked wonders in that territory. He split the sea, led his people by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He split the rock to make water and brought streams of water flow from the stone. God was everything his people needed. He rescued them, he redeemed them, he led them, he sustained them. And yet, as we read in verses 17 to 20, they forgot where all this provision had come from. Verse 17, but they continued to sin against him, rebelling in the desert against the Most High. They demanded food they craved instead of being thankful for the food they had already abundantly received. So after witnessing all that God has done, how could they so quickly forget how he had sustained them? And how could they question whether God could provide further for them? We see it in verse 18. They said, is God able to provide food in the wilderness? Look, he struck the rock and water gushed out, torrents overflowed. But can he also provide bread or furnish meat for his people? Now, they questioned God's goodness. Now, remember, this was written to a generation much later. Uh, The original uh, people are those in Exodus. He's reminding them of these things. And so the question is, will the present reader do likewise? Or will they forget what God has done? Will they pass on what God has done and teach the next generation? Asaph, the psalmist who writes this, knows his history well. It's been implanted deep inside and is ready to burst into song for others to hear. Now, these aren't just words written down. It's a mascal. It's a song. Is this the same with us? Now, we too have had God's wondrous works and mighty acts handed down to us? Have we likewise stored up God's word in our heart to the point that it may spring forth ready to tell others? God had provided in abundance, and yet the Israelites became discontent and craved more. They looked elsewhere instead of looking to who had provided. I think we can be a bit like that too, can't we? Uh, We look for contentment outside of God, thinking that somehow we need more than what he's already provided. The Israelites had water from the rock and manna from heaven. We have Jesus. He says, I am the bread of life. All who come to me will never be hungry. And anyone who is thirsty and comes to me, I will give streams of living water flow from deep within him. I think Peter sums it up pretty well in John 6. After Jesus has just spoken about himself being the bread of life, many leave. They say, this teaching's too hard. And Jesus asks Peter, is he going to go away as well? And Peter replies, well, where else have we to go? You have the words of eternal life. We find contentment and fulfillment nowhere else. To think otherwise is to forget what God has done for us in providing Jesus. To forget is to slowly drift off course. The psalmist is saying we need to be constantly reminding ourselves of what God has already done for us, what Jesus has achieved for us. And the only way we can do that is to be constantly in the word, each day reminding ourselves, recounting, Jesus' great victory over sin for us, remembering that, 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 remembering that everything is already ours in Christ. Uh, one author puts it like this. At the end of the day, there is simply no replacement for finding a regular time and place, blocking out distractions, putting your nose in the text, or God's word, and letting our mind and heart be led and captured and thrilled by God himself, communicating to us in his objective 
written words. Read God's word every day. Preach the gospel to yourself and pass on the gospel to the next generation. Because if we don't, we are prone to wander, prone to leave the God we love. And we will again repeat uh, the failures of Israel all those years ago. The Israelites looked for contentment outside of God, and if we're not careful, we will be no different. But contentment wasn't their only issue, nor is it ours. They forgot God's character, his goodness, authority, and sufficiency. And they forgot the new identity that God had given them, looking elsewhere for their identity. So point two, uh, lost identity. God had done amazing works and performed wondrous acts in Egypt, as the psalmist recalls in verses 43 to 51. Uh, These uh, events uh, are not just additional history lessons, but but he gives them to counter the forgetfulness of his people. Uh, Verse 40, just before that. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. They constantly tested and provoked the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power on the day he redeemed them from the foe. And then the writer goes into the events of the Exodus and the wilderness. He turned rivers to blood He sent among them swarms of flies. He gave crops to the caterpillars. He killed their vines with hail and held, handed over their livestock to hail. He cleared a path for his anger. He did not spare them from death, but delivered their lives to the plagues. He struck all the firstborn in Egypt, the first of the tents of Ham. He led his people out like sheep. He recalls the events and then goes on to show how God has provided. At 52 to 55, we read how God led his people out like sheep and guided them like a flock in the wilderness. He led them safely and brought them into his holy territory, the promised land. He drove out nations and apportioned their inheritance by lot. These verses are, I think, what I can only think of the most succinct recap of the books of Exodus to Joshua. The Exodus all the way into acquiring the land. What more could God have done? God worked powerfully for his people. And yet, as we read in verse 56, they rebelliously tested the Most High God, for they did not keep his decrees. They treacherously turned away like their fathers. They became warped like a faulty bow. They enraged him with their high places and provoked his jealousy with their carved images. They have set up for themselves idols, sacrificing in the high places. Idols of gods made by human hands, carved images that could not hear, speak or move having gathered them as a people and brought them into the land, the people still reject God, having forgotten what he had done for them. And while idolatry is the presenting issue, I think the heart of the issue is identity. God had brought them into the promised land, and yet instead of seeing themselves as God saw them, as a chosen people loved and cherished, created in his image, to display that image to the nations around them, it actually went the other way. They adopted the image of those around them and they took on the ways and beliefs of the nations. The writer Asaph is recalling these events. More importantly, he's recalling these attitudes as a warning to the present reader. Would they, like those who had come before them, look to the culture around them for their identity? Or would they learn the lessons from the past? Will they remember God and place their identity in him? Would they look, sound and act like everyone else in the culture around them? The same question can be asked of us today. 
as present readers of Psalm 78? Uh, Is the first thing that you see or hear in the morning something that reminds you that you are a child of God, that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people's for his possession, so that you might declare his praise? Do you reach for God's word for your worth and value? Or do you reach for your phone or for the newspaper? In reaching for our phone, we can so easily turn responding to work emails into ways to justify our self-worth or scrolling on social media into liturgies of comparison. Do you follow a particular political party closer than you follow the Saviour? This psalm is a reminder that if we are to be faithful and to pass on faithfully the things of God so that a future generation might put their confidence in God, we need to be reminding ourselves first. We need to be delving daily into God's word so that we are confronted by our sin, that we are comforted by the Father's love for us, encouraged in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and seeking the Spirit's help to follow Jesus daily. Only by regularly spending time in God's Word will our identity be shaped by God and not by the culture around us. Discontentment, lost identity, are two big issues for God's people in Psalm 78. Psalm 78 is a call to remember what God has done for his people in order that the, that truth might be passed on to future generations. It warns of the risks of forgetting that as a people we are so easily we easily become discontent looking for satisfaction in places other than God. That we also seek an image for ourselves often outside of God. Our values and self-worth are wrapped up in our work, uh, the effectiveness of our businesses, how much crops we gathered in, our families, our children. I think the biggest issue that God's people faced, and still face maybe, is uh, it comes in the middle of the psalm, verses 32 to 39. And it has its hope at the end. And so that's, for this reason, I've left it till last, because it's of greater significance, I think. The psalm again recalls the events of the Exodus and the wilderness. God, God's people have sinned and rebelled. God has disciplined his people for their rebellion. And yet we read in verses 32, and it caps off at 42, Despite all this, they kept sinning and did not believe his wondrous works. And 42 closes it, how often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. They did not remember his power. The heart of the issue is that God's people forgot that without God, there is no redemption. There is no salvation. They would still be slaves in Egypt, still under the yoke of Pharaoh. They are a people who at times only pay lip service to God. Now, verse 34 might sound encouraging, but it goes downhill quickly. When, God, when he, God, killed some of them, the rest began to seek him. They repented and searched for God. They remembered that God was their rock the Most High God, their Redeemer. It sounds great. You wonder, finally, have they learnt the lesson? But too quickly, we're reminded of their heart attitude. Verse 36, But they deceived him with their mouths. They lied to him with their tongues. The people are incapable of saving themselves and yet trying to deceive the very God who had redeemed them. In the middle of this psalm, about God's people's persistent forgetfulness, we have the heart of the gospel. 
Now, the good news that says that while we were dead in our sins and unable to save ourselves, God himself provides a way for us to be made right with him. The psalmist gives us these beautiful words in verse 38 to describe God's response to our constant rebellion. Yet he was compassionate. He atoned for their iniquity and did not destroy them. He often turned his anger aside and he did not unleash all his wrath. He remembered that they were only flesh, a wind that passes and does not return. God understands his people's greatest need is atonement of iniquity, atonement for sin and rebellion. And that is something that we cannot achieve on our own. It was the case for the Israelites, it is the same for us today. Without God, we are trapped in sin, dead in our transgressions and iniquity, and under the just judgment of God. We act as though we are God and God is not. And yet, wonderfully, God does not leave us in the cycle of sin and rebellion that we see in Psalm 78. But as the writer points out at the end of the psalm, in psalm at verse 70, he chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheep pen to be shepherd over his people. He shepherded them with a pure heart and guided them with skill. For Asaph, he's looking back at what God had done. He writes to remind the people of God's faithfulness. Know these things, he says, so that you may teach the next generation. But of course, these words don't just point back. They also point forward to the true and better David, lowly shepherd and mighty king. These words point to Jesus, who says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I lay it down so that I may take it up again. Jesus is the atonement for us. Jesus stood in our place knowing the Father wasn't going to turn aside his anger. He died for us even when, or so that, the Father could pour out all of his wrath on sin. And he took up his life on the third day and now reigns in all glory and power. As Steve mentioned in the kids' talk, that simple message, we need to be constantly reminding ourselves of what Jesus has done for us. And we need constant reminders that we are not God. And that our greatest need is Jesus stepping into our place for us. Neglect to remind ourselves and the next generation, we along with them will gradually drift away from centre. Each and every day we need to remind ourselves, I died to sin upon the cross. I'm bound to Jesus in his death. The old is gone and now I must rely on him for every breath. Psalm 78 is not your normal psalm. It's a call to God's people to remind themselves constantly of what God has done for us, to realign ourselves, to stop the slow drift. Uh, In one sense, it's a discipleship model. Learn from those who have gone before, saturate yourself in God's word and pass it on to the next generation so that we and they may put their confidence in God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we so constantly drift from you. And we constantly forget what you have done for us. I remind us each and every day through your Spirit uh, to be reading your Word and to be saturating ourselves in your word, uh, to delve deep uh, into your word. I thank you that you have given us your word and that it conveys who you are. Uh, It also conveys who we are, a sinful and in need of a saviour. Help us to find our identity in you, to find our contentment in you,
and to realize that there is no other place for salvation except in you. I thank you, Jesus, for your life, death, and resurrection, and that we may be right with God, our Father, our brother, Jesus Christ, and our guide, the Spirit. Amen.